Hello folks and welcome back and in, uh, this lecture is a, a, be a brief uh, look into this first bit of uh, Kyle William Bishop's book uh, American Zombie Gothic. I want to you know make sure we're all on the same page and I want to give you some strategies for how to read this book and other uh, scholarly books like this because it can be quite daunting and challenging uh, even for advanced students. So, so if you struggle with this book uh, so far don't don't let that get you down. <laughs> uh, it's just a uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to read scholarly uh, work, especially if you're not prepared for it. So uh, I'll try to give you some tips and strategies in here to help with that. Uh, but to start off with, I want you just to think about two different uh, zombie stories you've read. Could be a TV show, a movie, maybe zombies in a video game, uh, anything. Just try to think of uh, two different representations of zombies or two things where the zombies are uh, somewhat different and just compare and contrast those the zombies in those two different things. So if you want to talk about the zombies in Resident Evil versus the ones in The Walking Dead or some other movie or show, you know, have at it. Uh, just try to think of at least two. And you don't need to write a whole lot. Just I want you to be thinking about how zombies are different in different productions. And come back and we'll continue. Uh, okay, here's the objectives for this lecture. I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, well, what Bishop says anyway about why even study zombies, what's so significant about zombies or the walking dead, the whatever you want to call them. Why is this a worthy topic? What is so uh, important about them? We'll get into that first. Uh, we'll talk about the connection between what is popular in a current horror genre and uh, real life cultural events and concerns. Uh, so what we'll see is that basically what people find scary in movies and stories and books uh, has a lot to do with what's going on in the real world at that time uh, that they're reading those stories. Same stuff that was scary to somebody back in, say, 1850 is not the same as what's going to scare somebody in 1950 and, you know, looking forward in 2050. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit. I think that's really where that's, uh, it really gets to be interesting to me to think about that one. Uh, and then the third one, uh, again, how can we use this connection to study real history? So what can we learn about what life was like in the 1950s, for example, by watching movies from the 1950s and, and going all the way back? Uh, you know, I certainly, I'm probably not the only one who enjoys those old uh, classic horror flicks like Frankenstein and Dracula. And, uh, the thing, what is it called? The Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> those sorts of classic uh, monster movies. You can watch them just because they're fun to watch, but you can also learn a little bit about what was going on in uh, American culture at the time those movies came out. Uh, all right, so first I want to take a look in, actually look at the book, Bishop. We'll take a look here at some of the, some passages from this uh, with a goal of understanding more about how scholarship works in a general sense. So part of the reason of this class, you know, I don't want you just to walk away knowing more about zombies. <laughs> you know, the point is to learn more about how to be uh, a good scholar, you know, how to write good scholarly prose, how to be a better academic. So we want to take a look at how uh, Bishop tries to ground what he wants to talk about in this conversation, if you will, or broader discussion around uh, the idea of literature and the Gothic literature in particular. So it's it's kind of hard to explain that. I'll just show you an example, and then you'll probably say, oh, I get it. <laughs> so we'll just jump ahead. Uh, and also this idea that scholarship always has to be something totally original. A lot of people think that if they don't know much about scholarship they think the only ideas worth writing about is something that nobody has ever considered before or nobody's ever thought of this uh, idea this theory that's really not how scholarship works in reality uh, it's, it's kind of the opposite of that actually uh, most scholarship builds on something that was there before uh, so in bishop's case he's starting with this idea of the gothic literature uh, we'll talk about what that is in a minute uh, but then he just says but hey we haven't really talked about zombies you know, in the context of a gothic literature before. So that's his contribution, but he didn't just make it up. Uh, he's basing it on this substantial work of uh, existing scholarship. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at an actual example here. Uh, so what I have here is a screenshot, basically, of the Kindle book. Just the first part of this, um, I think, yeah, just introductory chapter. I think it's, he calls it introduction. So what I want to draw your attention to is how he begins by referencing somebody else. And this is called a reference here. 
He says, all great literary productions manifest what Stuart Hall calls, quote, cultural identity, a revelation about our collective one true self, again in, in quotes here, that is both historical and ever-changing. And then he's got a footnote there where you can uh, see basically uh, what book uh, Stuart Hall, or what, what article, I guess, Stuart Hall is, is saying this in. So you think, well, it's kind of weird to start off this book, you know, by quoting somebody else. Who is who is this Stuart Hall? Uh, why do we care about his uh, definition here of cultural identity and all this stuff? So that's, uh, you know, when you first start reading the scholarship, this this kind of thing puzzles people. Like, why don't you just tell us what you think? Why are you talking about this Stuart Hall character? Uh, but Bishop's doing this because he wants to ground what he's going to say about zombies in this, again, discussion, conversation, whatever you want to call it, that people are already having about culture and society and the roles of storytelling in cultures, you know, anthropology, cultural studies, uh, there's different names for it. And Stuart Hall was kind of a big deal in the field of cultural studies. So Bishop wants to open up by mentioning Stuart Hall because that kind of gets him some instant credibility. Uh, somebody who does, he's a little skeptical about the idea of reading about zombies. Uh, they might feel better if they say, well, you know, he's connecting this to what Stuart Hall is saying. Uh, so that gives it a little bit more weight, a little bit more uh, gravitas, if you will. Uh, then he moves on from the Hall quotation to talk about Tony Magistrell, uh, who again, he'll use some ideas from Magistrell, specifically this one. This is a quote again from, uh, from Magistrell. It's nothing less, so he says, all literature, both in print and on screen, addresses society's most pressing fears and is, quote, nothing less th than a barometer for measuring an era's cultural anxieties. So here, uh, Bishop is basically setting up the type of theories he's going to be working with, these ideas about uh, culture, identity, uh, the, uh, the literature, which in this case will be zombie horror flicks. Now those will, ha to some extent, be a barometer for measuring an era's cultural anxiety. So it's, it's a metaphor that Magistral works with in his article that Bishop has just borrowed and, and quoted, so he'll be using it too. And I'm not going to go through the whole you know, introduction like this, but you notice right up next he goes into uh, Jared E. Hogel and gives us a quote from him. So I like to, you know, when I'm uh, working with students, whether at this level or at the graduate level, it's good to sit down and like look at how people are doing this. Uh, because the time will come when you need to put some quotations in and, and ground whatever your argument is in terms of you know existing scholarship. So really dilating and, and looking closely at these examples from Bishop, you know, really should clear things up for you. Uh, you, you know, obviously, you wouldn't be using these same exact quotations, but just the strategy uh, will work uh, regardless of your topic. You know, find somebody that's saying something around your topic, quote them. Uh, reference them, and then that will help you to build your argument. Okay, uh, Bishop's thesis in this book, or this is a thesis in general, and I'm going to try to start bringing in some uh, advice, some tips for you when you sit down to write your rhetorical analysis. And one part of a rhetorical analysis is a thesis. Some people call it a thesis statement, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one sentence. It could be a couple, it could be a whole paragraph. It's basically just a part of a paper, an essay, uh, that does these four things here. Uh, one would be to say, what is the point here? You know, what are you trying to argue? What exactly is your, you know, your claim? Uh, that's the first part. Uh, the second part will be some kind of statement about why this work is important to somebody besides the author. There's a fancy way to say that, exigence. This word here, it's very academic. <laughs> uh, an easier way to think about this is just the so what question. So why should anybody else care? Maybe you just really like zombies and you like to read and write about them, but why should I I care? Why should students care? What bearing does this have on anything? Why, why should this be of interest? You know, ultimately, why should we be paying somebody to do this kind of research? Uh, you know, of course, most, <laughs> you know, most college research, most of this research ultimately comes back to the taxpayers, right? So and there needs to be some reason why this is important work. Uh, and then this uh, idea of the theoretical framework, and if you think about it, we've already done that. Uh, I've already showed you that aspect, but that's where he is bringing in these recognized scholars. Uh, was it was Hogel, Magistral, and uh, Stuart Hall, 
Uh, he's saying, look, here are the authors that I'm going to be using to construct my argument. I'm going to be using some vocabulary from them. So I'm going to be quoting them. I'm going to be citing them. They'll be the important, uh, that's the thought I'm building my argument on. It's called the theoretical framework. Uh, so he's already done that in that very first paragraph, but he'll be bringing in a lot of other people as he, as he goes along. But those are his main sources. Uh, and then finally, some idea of how this work is organized. And if you notice, I'm not going to... Uh, show it all here, but if you read the last few pages of this introduction, uh, Bishop goes through like, chapter 1, I'm going to do this. Chapter 2 is going to be about this. Chapter 3 is going to be about this, and so on and so forth. Uh, same exact thing you should do in an essay, or a uh, if you do write a thesis, if you go to graduate school. Uh, they'll want to know, you know, how are you going to set this thing up? What's going to be in these paragraphs that follow? Uh, what's your structure? Okay, and here's, here's where he's providing some exigence or some significance. Uh, and it's a little bit later in the paragraph. But you notice he's, he's, again, going back to this idea of I'm not just coming up with this stuff. You know, I'm building on the work of other people. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I had to quote a, a line from uh, 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 Isaac Newton. <laughs> uh, so he says here, As in the past... Perceptive scholars can quite readily recognize and understand this shift in the cultural consciousness through patterns in narrative fiction. And I ultimately want to argue that zombie cinema is among the most culturally revealing and resonant fictions of the past decade of unrest. Now, so here in this sentence, he's basically saying, look, here's what's been said, or here's what perceptive scholars would already have said, have already said, have already thought. But here's what, you know, I'm going to add to this conversation. Look, here's what I want to do. I want to argue that zombie cinema is you know part of this uh, should should be part of this discussion right so he's got kind of his hand up this is his contribution this is the i say part of this old formula and really if you get into a habit of thinking this way it's going to help you not just in this class but with any kind of scholarly work you do any essay research paper whatever you can just sort of in uh what's the word uh sort of absorb this and, and imitate this model and it will serve you well going forward. Uh, so here's a few tips about how to read works like Bishop. You know, I find students sometimes will say, uh, man, this book was really confusing or really hard or I just read like it was just gibberish to me. I, I couldn't follow it at all. Uh, and, you know, I have to say it's not like I just sit down and, and this is just the most, <laughs> you know, easy reading. <laughs> uh, this is not light reading for, for anybody, I think, even though it's, you know, about a, a fun topic. Uh, but it's not that you might think, well, that's just because Bishop is a crappy writer, or this is just a, a terrible book. You know, it's nothing like that. It's, it's, it's the problem is the audience is not, you know, you're not used to reading books from this, uh, written for this audience. And uh, the audience, of course, is the other scholars, uh, you know, PhDs, students in graduate school, and also, of course, you, uh, more advanced college students. But what really makes it hard isn't just, yeah, there's some vocabulary, you know, some long words that you have to look up. And one of the reasons I love the, the Kindle version when I'm reading something like this, I can just literally put my finger on the word I don't know, and it will take me to a definition. And, and I frequently use that. I'm a professor, English professor, and yes, there's plenty of words. Either uh, I don't know, I've never seen the word before, or it's been long enough, I don't really remember the, the definition. So... You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel bad at all uh, if you don't recognize the word. You know, the only reason you should feel bad is if you don't bother to look it up and, and you know, figure out what it means. And so keep that handy. Uh, but it can also be challenging, again, because they are assuming that you're familiar with this field. You know, back in this line here, Bishop expects you to know who Stuart Hall is. And, you know, the idea is, oh, Stuart Hall, yes, I know him. You know, I've read Stuart Hall's work. I know all about articulation theory and, and all the sort of terminology that goes with that. Uh, but, of course, you don't know, more than likely, who Stuart Hall is because you're new. You know, this might be the first time you're being exposed uh, to the name Stuart Hall and all these other, other names. Nevertheless, it's assumed by this book, or by a bishop assumes, you're either familiar with that already or you can find out by you know, talking to your professor or you know, Wikipedia is actually a great place to go to find, uh, you know, you, I just go to Google sometimes and type in, who is Stuart Hall? <laughs> and it works uh, surprisingly well, and it usually will take you to the Wikipedia page, and there you can read a little bit about this person and, you know, see what he's all about. Uh, 
but that's what makes it hard is that you don't really know all that much about this yet so you've kind of been thrown into the deep end of the of the pool and you have to uh, swim uh, another thing that makes it challenging is that since it's scholarly work bishop is assuming that people are going to be reading whatever claim he makes and thinking well hmm you know i, I don't know about that maybe we could or i could argue another side or where's your evidence uh, you make this claim i i want to see some evidence for this and so he's assuming that there's going to be this sort of argumentative uh, reader, uh, you know, reading this piece. So he's, he's got to try to make sure that he covers all the bases and provides uh, reasons uh, to support his claims. And that, you know, can sometimes make make it seem like it's really long or it seems to be going on too long about this point. But he's, just, he's anticipating objections. You know, that's another thing that doesn't necessarily make it exciting to read. He's just trying to be thorough. Uh, so again, don't feel bad if you have to look up things. I do it all the time. Actually, I like to. I like the uh, digital assistants like Alexa. She probably wake up. Yeah, she woke up. <laughs> and Google <laughs> and Siri, because uh, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll ask them what the word means, and I listen because they will say the word as well. Because a lot of times you might not know how to pronounce the word, uh, so I will ask them, oh, Alexa, what is this word? And I'll, sometimes I'll spell it. And she'll tell me uh, what it means, but also how it's pronounced. And then I'll try to remember that uh, so I don't uh, get embarrassed if I have to use the word myself at some point. All right, so just some general, really quick reading strategies for any academic prose. Uh, I like to read the chapter first, just the headings, of the, you know, flip through the whole chapter. Don't try to read it line for line to see how's it, you know, how many sections there are. How's it start? You know, always read the introduction and the conclusion our first paragraph and last paragraph, I'll read those first, actually, and then go back and start reading uh, reading again from the top. But you're just trying to get a sense of the big picture before you go diving into the, the, the uh, details. Uh, if you don't know, so if a paragraph or a sentence doesn't make sense, you know, don't just stop and freeze forever. You know, just, just make a note on the side somewhere, or highlight it, and then come back to it later. Sometimes it'll make sense later. Right now it might be hard to follow. So you just want to make a note of stuff you don't understand and, and move on and come back later and see if it makes more sense. Uh, three, reading that first and last paragraphs of each section first is, is a good strategy as well as the first and last sentence of each paragraph. So it's kind of like a hamburger. You know, you want to look at the top bun, the bottom bun. <laughs> that's where you hold it, right? <laughs> and so that's where you should be, uh, you should come into contact with that part first, you know, and then worry about the uh, the stuff inside this the sandwich, I guess, to go with this metaphor, uh, after you've got a pretty good sense of how it starts and how it ends. Uh, and four, try to get a sense of what the author feels are particularly important points, you know, and make note of those. And again, this is a reason to, you know, usually the author will put the most important ideas in, in the first section and then come back and repeat or refer back to them at the end. So this kind of all ties together. Yeah, so usually the stuff that like Bishop, he starts off talking about Stuart Hall and Hogel and, and, Mon and this idea of the barometer of cultural anxieties and all this. You know, sure enough, if you read the conclusion, he comes back to those ideas again. So that should be uh, a pretty good clue. You know, these are the important ideas. These are the takeaway points. Even if I don't understand everything in the middle, you know, as long as you get those major points, uh, you know, you're doing okay. You'll be okay. <laughs> All right, so some important points in the chapter then, so to kind of go along with this mindset. And I, again, I'm not going to do this for every chapter. I'm just trying to give you a, an example of how this works for me, you know, when you actually sit down to do this. Now, so here's what I took away. Uh, one is just the word zombie, the concept of a zombie, is not the same as it was when it first came about. All right, this, this is a concept that has evolved over many, many years. And we're going to see many different kinds of zombies as we go along historically. Uh, that's, that's the first big idea, right, is that this idea, uh, the, the zombie creature has changed over time. P pretty simple. Uh, two, he makes a claim that the zombie, it's not the same as vampire and a werewolf and a ghost and, and all these other older, uh, older monsters. There's something special about zombies. That's the you know second idea. They're they're unique. You're new. They're they are unique. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so that's a pretty big claim. Uh, so we want to be paying attention to that, seeing if we agree with uh, Bishop on that point or not. And then three, probably the biggest claim. Uh, this is the so what question. The exigence is that yeah you know study zombies. It's not really about the zombie. 
right? It's it's if you study how these, a zombie has evolved in cinema, what you find is that it's related somehow to real life historical events, such as the Vietnam War, such as 9/11, and these things will feed into each other. Uh, so we can learn more about how the Vietnam War, for example, affected culture by watching uh, horror films from that era. And, and, and even vice versa, so it can work the opposite direction, too. If we, we could study the Vietnam War to learn more about, uh, oh, what is it, uh, Dawn of the Dead, for example. Kind of, it's a two-way street. All right, and then what is the Gothic? Uh, he doesn't really, again, he just kind of assumes you know what Gothic means, what Gothic literature means, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you do or not. You, know, you, you might be somebody who studies literature and you're already familiar with this, but just in case you're not, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, slow down and define this term a little bit. You know, it is where the part of the title of the, of the uh, book. Uh, so uh, Gothic is referred to, it's referring to a literary period. So you could 18th century literature, 18th century British, American, you know, there's all these different periods that people study when they study literature. And Gothic literature is basically one of those areas It's a specialty. Um, it covers a pretty large time frame, but it includes works like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You might have read that at some point. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know, another pretty popular uh, novel. It's really, a lot of this stuff holds up well, by the way. Even though it's pretty old, you can still pick these up and, and just read them for pleasure. And, of course, the works of Edgar Allan Poe, a fa fabulous author. <laughs> so, a lot of people love these, and they study them professionally. They become professors just so they can study Frankenstein, Dracula, and Poe, and they, they love it. Um, what do all these things have in common? Why are they grouped under this category of Gothic? And I found a definition of Gothic literature from Patrick Kennedy, and I, I think this is a pretty uh, succinct list of things. So to be gothic, it has to employ dark and picturesque scenery. I think all, all of this stuff applies if you think about Dracula, those old sort of cobwebby castles and, and dungeons and, you know, the mad scientist lab and all this. You probably say that's a pretty dark scene. It's not a place I would want to visit. <laughs> Actually, I probably would. <laughs> but, you know, it's probably not the most pleasant environment. Kind of scary, kind of spooky. Uh, two, startling and melodramatic narrative devices. You know, so you, a lot of, ooh, oh, wow, what just happened there? You know, a lot of uh, big moments, I guess. Uh, surprises. Uh, this, you know, I could talk about this all day, but again, I'll try to keep it moving. Uh, and three, an overall atmosphere of exoticism, mystery, fear, and dread. So it's almost like a mood. You know, if you sit down and read Dracula, for example... Uh, it really kind of creeps you out. You know, it kind of gets under your skin somehow. There's there's other authors. I'd say the same thing about Edgar Allan Poe if you've ever sat down and read his work. Or H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Uh, who else? Maybe even some of Stephen King's work, you know. But uh, a lot of the stuff, it's it's not exactly... It's hard to describe how it's, it's more spooky, I would say, than just terrifying. It's just kind of this mood of uh, uh, unrest, I guess is the word that they use. It kind of makes you uncomfortable reading it. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of a, uh, a sensation that you, I guess, people enjoy because they, you know, <laughs> look at all these years later, people are still reading these these works. So there, there's something about it uh, that resonates even today. And then uh, Kennedy goes on to say, a, a gothic novel or a story will revolve, usually, I guess, um, will revolve around a large ancient house that conceals a terrible secret or serves as the refuge of an especially frightening and uh, threatening character. You know, so there's there's some creepy person in the attic. <laughs> there's something in the cellar. <laughs> you know, there's this uh, you know big old house, and there's something uh, scary in there that's been repressed. Uh, this this hidden, and the hero or the heroine of the story at some point will find out what that secret thing is, and it will be this big, you know, melodramatic moment when you find out what <laughs> what this creepy thing is in the house somewhere. <laughs> You know, and if you're like me, you, you probably, especially when you start reading and watching The Walking Dead, and you might experience nightmares, uh, or at least unpleasant dreams, where you're sort of in this house. And you think you've probably been in this house before, at least it feels like that in the dream, and there's like, like rooms in the house that you didn't know were there. And you, like in the dream, you say, uh, you find a secret room somewhere in this house, or there's you're running from something from room to room. And it's it's, it's so weird. It's kind of like this psychological thing about these, uh, 
you know, these large ancient houses. I mean, I don't know how many times I've had this dream where I'm in this huge house with all these rooms and, you know, you know it feels like I'm familiar with it somehow, even though I've never been inside a house like that. Uh, so just try it out. I'd be curious to know, you know, if and when you start having those dreams in this course after, you know, delving into The Walking Dead, you, you have to let me know. Uh, okay, so Bishop then adds a few things that he says characterize the zombie or the American zombie gothic from those older gothic stories like Dracula. Uh, he says, well, of course, there's zombies in them. That's kind of obvious. Uh, yes, there are zombies in zombie stories. Uh, you know, <laughs> everybody knows that. But he says there's some other other things as well. Uh, one is the collapse of societal infrastructures. Makes a pretty good point there that if you don't have like the collapse of society then the zombies are easy to take out right <laughs> the, you know, the army shows up poof, poof, poof. Uh, they shoot the zombies and you know the end the end everybody's happy <laughs> uh, it doesn't work like that you have to have some kind of breakdown so that it's not just a simple matter of you know calling in the, in the troops to deal with the problem uh, there has to be this collapse that takes place so that you know civilization isn't there to take care of the problem uh, two, there's some kind of resurgence of what he calls survivalist fantasies. Uh, and we'll get into this throughout the semester, but, you know, there's an idea that a lot of people feel repressed. They feel beaten down, downtrodden. You know, they're kind of lorded over by rich and the wealthy and the powerful. Uh, and they're treated like dirt, basically. But if there was just if there was just a zombie apocalypse, you know, or something similar to this, uh, that would flip around. And so suddenly the people that are kind of at the bottom right now, who basically work for a living, uh, who, who know a thing or two about a thing or two, you know, you know those folks, farmers and, and all the folks that work with their hands, uh, suddenly they would be like the most valuable people in society, right? Because they know how to grow the food. You know, they know how to get, keep the car running. You know, they know how to do all this practical stuff. Uh, even though in our society, right now, they don't make nearly as much as some kind of you know, lawyer or, you know, politician or whatever, uh, some type of a technology expert. Uh, but suddenly this equation would be flipped around. And, you know, that's what they call some of the Some people fantasize about how wonderful that would be. Or maybe just as simple as, uh, you know, they like thinking about what you would do in some kind of scenario like this, and they want to be prepared. And then the fear of other surviving humans, which I think is one of the most interesting things about zombie flicks, because it's usually at some point, and they mention 28 Days Later a few times, but pretty much every zombie movie or show, that you, know, you kind of quickly get over the fear of the actual zombies. You know, they're usually not that menacing. You can get away from them. You can handle them. It's the other humans that turn out to be a much more dangerous problem. Uh, so I think Bishop was right on, on all three of these. And then just a few last things to point out here. Uh... One is that it'll be significant that the zombies are corpses of the known dead. You know, these uh, the zombie doesn't look like an alien from another planet. It's not some kind of fantastic creation. You know, part of what makes it scary is it looks like a person, and it could even be like your this was your dad or this was your sister. Uh, now it's a uh, on the monster and it's out to kill you. <laughs> There's something even scarier about that uh, than just some kind of fantastic giant spider. Let's say. Uh, two, zombies can't be reasoned with, appealed to, or dissuaded by logical discourse. Yeah, you're not going to argue your way out of a zombie attack. Uh, and then three, zombies are in an active state of decay. Uh, so there's a reason why you don't, we have all these funeral ceremonies, funeral rites. You know, somebody passes, we don't, uh, you know, quickly want to get, you know, them buried or, or cremated or whatever, whatever the case may be. And the argument is we do that as a society because if, if, you know, if you saw corpses, you know, if you saw, like, decaying bodies, and this, you know, used to be the case back in, you know, ancient times, of course. This was much more common uh, that you would see a, a dead person. Uh, but the argument is we don't like that because it scares us because it kind of makes us aware of our own mortality, right? We, we don't like to think one day I'm going to be dead. <laughs> Nobody, uh, usually people don't enjoy that thought. It, it's sort of terrifying. It's unsettling. And so what makes the zombie so scary, I guess, is that, you know, you can sort of see them walking around, but you can see that decay taking place kind of reminds you again of your own mortality. So all interesting points that Bishop makes, you know, and we'll delve more into these throughout the semester. Uh, okay, so let's wrap this up then. I have an, uh, one last question for you. So just thinking at this point, uh, you know, Bishop, 
I don't know exactly when he wrote this book. I want to say 2008, somewhere around in there. Uh, so it's been a while. Uh, I think it's been updated since. But anyway, he wrote this before, of course, this, this pandemic uh, that we're in now, though he does mention you know, the possibility of pandemics and epidemics. I'm just wondering what you think. Do you think that, you know, if, you were, if another zombie show comes out or another zombie movie, uh, how will it change? Will it, will, this, will it somehow be a different type of zombie uh, in light of recent events? Do you think that zombie films will look different somehow or be different in the future, next few years? Uh, or will they just stay the same uh, as they are in shows like The Walking Dead? You know, I'd be curious to know what your thinking is on that. Uh, anyway, that'll do it uh, for this lecture. If you have questions or comments, love to hear those. Please uh, share them with me. Uh, so we'll leave it here and See you next time.